personal violence that has occurred during COVID. And we also are co-chairing together with the um, group that's doing international um, whole person treatment therapy. So we're all psychologists or mostly psychologists. So are in the mental health field. And we spend every Thursday from 12 to 1 Eastern time trying to share with other mental health professionals, but also anybody who jump, jumps in uh, on our Facebook pages. We have a Facebook page called IVID, um, COVID IPV. And we have another one for the International Whole Person Approaches to Therapy. So you can jump on in either place. We will look for your questions there. Uh, we're also on in Zoom and um, we will have other people joining our Zoom call during the hour. Um, so we're gonna first start off as we often do with a guest. But before that, I wanna tell you something very exciting. Congress, the United States Congress just reissued the Violence Against Women Act that expired in, in um, 2018. And uh, it's taken us three years and a new Congress to really pass it, but only half of the Congress passed it. We need the Senate to pass it. So I'm doing a little politicking because that act here really does help um, not only battered women and all kinds of, of um, interpersonal violence, but also men are now included in the new act as well who are being abused. And so we're really hoping uh, that we can get the financial um, benefits that this um, act uh, causes. So that's my little politics uh, for the day. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, just tell you who's on right now, and then uh, we'll um, jump to uh, Dr. Safir, who's going to um, uh, uh, introduce our guest. So you met um, Dr. Giselle Gaveria. She's uh, with us from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, as I am as well, as you can see in my background. We also have Dr. Marilyn Safer, who is in Haifa, Israel. And we have Dr. Eleanor Pardis, who is also in the Tel Aviv area in Israel. And we have Dr. Eric Pepper, who is with us from the Bay Area in California. And as I said, we'll see some other, um, we have people from all over the world who join in. And we have uh, also on the screen now, we're very, very pleased um, to have our guest, Dr. Skip Rizzo. Uh, who is going to uh, be talking to us. And I see just as we're starting off, uh, Amy Lee um, from California as well uh, is also uh, joining us. So with that, um, Dr. Seifer, I'm gonna turn it to you and have you introduce our guest. And uh, we have two guests, I see. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Rizzo's got his puppy. You'll hear my puppy jump barking too. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Safer. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Albert Skip Rizzo, who is one of the, um, in the forefront of designing programs that have been very successful in helping combat veterans deal with post-traumatic stress disorder and the whole concept of using virtual reality as a means of exposing to people in a controlled fashion to trauma, making it easier to treat them. Skip is the director of the Medical Virtual, Virtual Reality Lab, uh, the Institute of Creative uh, Technologies. He's also a research professor in the Department of Psychiatry and School of Gerontology at the University of South Carolina, and really has been in, sorry, Southern California. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a bad mistake. Um, so I'll turn this over to Skip. All righty. Well, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, it's great to see you. It's been a while, and I hope I get to uh, visit you sometime in Israel soon. But I also want to thank um, the host, uh, Lenore, Giselle, Eleanor, everybody that uh, has helped me uh, to have this opportunity to speak to everyone. I'm gonna to try to keep this to 30 minutes. So I'm not gonna give a long preamble. I'm just gonna jump right into popping up my slides 
and hopefully everything will work properly. You know how technology can be finicky sometimes. So um, my talk today will be on the use of clinical virtual reality and specifically in the area of PTSD from combat to cops to COVID and beyond. Um, I, as mentioned, this work, a lot of the work was done at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies where my lab is located, uh, the MedVR lab. And we've been doing this work since the mid nineties and have done work in a, a, across the spectrum of areas where VR can be usefully applied um, and include psych, cognitive motor and virtual human work. I'll just show a couple of little teaser videos to give you an idea of the, the breadth of the work and give you a little context for how VR is applied uh, across the spectrum of human functioning. Um, so in the psych area, this is, you'll see more of this later, but that's what one of the simulations that we use for uh, prolonged exposure therapy with combat veterans in an Iraq or an Afghan type context. For point of comparison, that's what it looked like in 2007. Uh, so you can see you have one minute to how much the graphics have evolved over the years. But in this case, what we did was we took our exposure app and used the, the simulation content to develop tests of cognitive function, uh, tests of attention, memory, and multitasking, uh, executive function, and so forth. Uh, and within a head-mounted display within a functionally relevant controlled environment. We don't just do military work. This was back from 1996, 97, uh, 3D projection system for uh, assessing and, and training mental rotation skills and other visual spatial abilities. Uh, a little bit later, we started doing uh, assessment with kids uh, with ADHD, but uh, really the attention process trainer in a virtual classroom or assessment tool in a virtual classroom. Um, basically, your child has to pay attention to stimuli on the board, continuous performance tasks, but meanwhile, distractions like the kid in the back row just do a paper airplane, school bus. So we can test and maybe train, uh, although we haven't really done a lot of that, it's mostly assessment. Um, we can assess attention in a controlled stimulus environment that's relevant to the real world with uh, systematically controlled distraction. It really illustrates the power of what we can do in, in VR simulations. And this is an old one. This is 2003. We have a new version. It's now um, going to be on the market shortly. Um, in the area of motor rehabilitation, um, using a Microsoft Connect camera, a depth sensing camera, this user is not wearing any instrumentation or markers the camera tracks her movement and parts it onto this little avatar and the whole goal here is to make very boring repetitive and frustrating physical and occupational therapy activities more fun and engaging by immersing them within a game-based environment and also measuring uh, performance within that environment and providing optimal feedback to users we took that same technology um, and the cerebral palsy foundation or national cerebral palsy foundation came to us and just had a simple request, make it so that kids with severe motor impairments can play video games. Um, and so this little girl, first time she's ever played a video game, and basically we use this technology, if you notice on the right, she's picking her arm up. That is, uh, is about the only movement that she had really good volition control. So that is for making this little shark jump out of the out of the water and so forth. So using the body as an interface to um, adjust it so that anybody that has some level of motor control in some area can use that motor control to interact with computers or with game like content. Um, and this is some of our, our newer work with the uh, head mounted displays and a sensor on the front is tracking hand movement. Uh, for So you get a first person perspective for eye hand coordination and eye hand uh, rehab. Um, Okay, virtual humans, I'm gonna show one that I think is particularly relevant for this audience and it's a virtual patient scenario. This is one we did for USC School of Social Work for their, they have sort of a certificate in military social work program. And it's a virtual patient. Hold on. There we go. Um, virtual patient uh, for practicing clinical interviewing. So here, um, here's an example of that. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. 
What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicided on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So that work has, that was from 2013, I believe. Uh, that work's evolved quite a, quite a bit since then. Um, I like to show some of the, the trajectory of the older stuff. So then when you see the newer stuff, you see, you know, where we are now. Uh, in fact, the technology has, in fact, caught up with the vision from the early days when we were struggling along with complex and expensive equipment. Um, but anyway, that uh, I always like to say with the virtual patient project, it's a way to give clinicians a chance, novice clinicians, a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. And I think we can all agree that kind of experiential training might be useful in your early days of clinical training. Um, and we also have done recent work with Greg Rieger up at the Puget Sound VA in a randomized controlled trial showing that people that practice motivational interviewing uh, with the virtual patients after they go through the standardized training uh, perform much better uh, in a real world assessed context uh, than people that just go through the standardized training and have an equivalent amount of review practice um, with paper and pencil stuff. Okay, um, finally, uh, another example of virtual human relevant to dealing with trauma, and this is more about breaking down barriers to care. This is an online intelligent agent that we call SimCoach and built it for um, Defense Center of Excellence. And basically, it was a place, a private and anonymous place where veterans, service members, or families could go and ask this guy questions about PTSD, TBI, substance use, all in a safe, private fashion. And he could give answers, direct you to resources. At the same time, he could ask questions um, that were thinly veiled screening questions. And if you hit a certain threshold, he might say, hey, look, uh, looks like you're having some trouble. If you want, um, you can punch in your zip code at the bottom here and uh, I'll pop up a list of providers in your area drawn from the National Center's Registry, National Center for PTSD. And um, if you want, we can talk about what therapy involves, and uh, I can tell you about you know what it involves. Anyway, so a way to not replace clinical care, but to put a toe in the water to help break down barriers to care and do it in a private, anonymous way for folks that are hesitant to initially have that discussion with a real person. So let me just let him introduce himself real quick. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking but I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Okay, so with that intro, what is VR? Uh, from a technocentric uh, perspective, it's a combination of enabling technologies, computers, head-mounted displays or other display technologies, interface devices, body tracking, all with the goal of putting people, um, allowing them to interact in simulated contexts um, for a specific purpose. I prefer the more human-centric definition, which is really just basic human-computer interaction, you know, ways for people to interact with computers or complex data in a more natural and intuitive fashion. And if how we've been interacting with computers over the last 30 years is any indicator, maybe it's time, you know, we, we created things where you could do things beyond what you can do of hunting and pecking on a keyboard or using a mouse. Now in mental health and rehab, the best metaphor for why we use VR is simulation technology. So just like an aircraft simulator serves to test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, teach, and treat psych cognitive motor functioning, the spectrum of areas, clinical conditions, and wellness, all within a controlled stimulus environment, sort of like the ultimate Skinner box. Um, over the years, since 1994, the field has evolved dramatically, uh, going from specific phobias to uh, the short list of clinical conditions where the science uh, has documented the added value of applying VR when applied judiciously, thoughtfully, theoretically informed. Um, and, you know, I mean, the good news, just as a, a takeaway bullet point, is that 
Um, when we got started in the early days, the technology was crude, primitive, as you see here. Um, but it's the technology has caught up with the vision in terms of fidelity and cost. And we have probably the largest scientific literature for any VR use case in mental health and rehab. So we've got a good roadmap. Science never ceases. We're always going to continue to evolve. But we got pretty promising uh, findings in a number of areas, PTSD included. So with that, let's talk just a little bit about exposure therapy. Now, uh, this was the area we chose, prolonged exposure, because when we build these things, we oftentimes um, don't stray too far from what we know is evidence-based in the real world, but rather look towards how can we enhance uh, the delivery of that treatment um, in a way that might engage people more or draw more people into therapy. Certainly VR is not the magic bullet, it's simply a tool, but we're, we start from a theoretical basis and then work from there. And everything I'm presenting here, it's stimulus content. You know, People that are interested in EMDR or in other types of therapies could probably implement um, some of our content in ways that might be helpful. Uh, so, and we're always open to that, by the way. So with that said, Going back in, in the old days with anxiety disorders, if you had claustrophobia in 97, happened to be in Spain at Christine Batella's lab, she'd put you in this little room, close the door, and then gradually move the wall in on you. And there's certainly more modern versions, but I like to show some of the old stuff first. And Chair of Heights was where the, the real science got its, its traction in this area a lot of work with Barbara Rothbaum's group and so on. But this is what it looked like back in 1994. Um, you know, nobody would ever mistake that for the real thing. And that was one of the big critiques back then. But the cool thing was that even though it wasn't an exact replica of the real world, it still had an emotionally evocative or activating effect so that you could do um, exposure therapy with anxiety disorders and get good clinical outcomes. And, and that's the good news with all of this, in spite of the impoverished nature sometimes of 3D graphic content or its failure to exactly replicate reality, um, we can fool the brain. You know, your brain, as you'll see in the next slide, um, knows that this is a simulation. But the perceptual array presented when you're immersed in these environments to the limbic system activates it like it's the real thing. So um, anyway, that's, a, that's something that flies across all areas of clinical VR. But here are some of the different applications. And you'll see the fear of heights application in contrast to what you just saw. I particularly like this one because, you know, it's you know, pitting your fear of heights against your love of kitty cats. And you have to go out there and rescue the cat. But you can see this guy on the plank is acting as if it's the real thing. Anyway, um, the research in this area has been uh, quite positive. In 2008, our group and another group both published meta-analyses coming to the same conclusion. VR was, in most cases, as good, if not better, uh, than uh, traditional imagination-only exposure therapy. I don't want to make too bold a claim on that, but, you know, at, 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 the, at the very bare minimum level, non-inferiority here. Um, and that meta-analysis was evolved uh, with another group in 2012, similar findings. 2015, uh, similar findings with the, um, um, you know, with the comparisons, but also showing uh, good generalization to the real world, people's behavior changes in the real world based on what they they do in the virtual world in this uh, therapeutic context. And more recently, Journal of Anxiety Disorders had a special issue uh, that Mark Powers and Barbara Rothbaum edited. Um, and one of the papers in there uh, was, a, you know, a review another meta-analysis and they came to the conclusion that, you know, this is an effective and equal medium for exposure therapy. So going from anxiety disorders to PTSD, we're not the first so uh, 
we got our traction uh, late 2003. We started building a prototype without any funding, building it off a game application uh, that we had access to. Um, but then when this paper came out, uh, you know, this was like a call to arms, if you will, um, and this really got people interested. So, Office of Naval Research approached us, and we got funded in 2005 to begin building this stuff. Um, <clears throat> And this is what it looked like in 2004, right here, where we took the street out of a video game that we had access to and modified it just as a prototype to shop around. You could hit a button, add crowd sound or ambient sound, hit another button and gunfire would pop up. You could have surgeons here, you could hit another button. Content like this, driving, all Anyway, uh, we tested this with users before actually developing a treatment program. This is Greg Rieger. Uh, at the from the Puget Sound VA when he was on active duty, taking a version, early version of the system to Iraq and actually testing with non PTSD folks uh, just to get their feedback. What did we get right? What did we get wrong? This is part of the design process, always testing in the early stages with your targeted uh, user group. And that information was vital to evolving our applications over time. And it continues now with patients and clinicians sharing feedback on the application. So I'm going to show a video for a few minutes on um, the current version and a patient profile. So you can kick back and have a coffee while this, uh, I think, four minute video runs. I literally had not talked about that scenario for 10 plus years. Never thought about it. I avoided thinking about it. This time as we go through, we have a civilian population to worry about. And um, it's kind of hard for us because we have to judge between the civilian and military. Some of the things that I saw and some things I did just stuck with me. Retired U.S. Marine Chris Merkel is about to return to war. A decade on from three tours in Iraq and four in Afghanistan, this time his front line is a virtual battlefield. You start to feel like you're there and then you see, like where I physically saw Iraq, how I remember it. In my mind, I could see that guy getting ready to shoot at us and it's so intense. This is Brave Mind, a virtual reality exposure therapy program designed by psychologist Albert Rizzo to treat various forms of post-traumatic stress disorder. How traumatic is it for a patient to face these painful memories head on, to relive them through Brave Mind? When you tell people about it initially, they say, why would you make somebody go back and confront these horrific experiences that they had? Well, we do it because the science shows that this is an effective approach, that helping a person to confront and reprocess difficult emotional memories, but in a safe place, getting them to talk about things they haven't talked to anybody about, that is the path to healing. Merkel says his time in service left him in a constant state of hypervigilance, leading to bouts of anger, depression, and insomnia. People return, they're not a whole person when they return. It's not like a movie, it's not instantaneous, it's not glorious, it's very violent, it's very visceral. And when traditional therapy failed to help his PTSD, he turned to the VR program to face uh, the very memories he had been avoiding for years. Contact front ID, left side. If you activate this fear, uh, this traumatic memory, um, but nothing bad happens, you're in a safe place with a supportive clinician, eventually that fear 
or anxiety extinguishes or habituates. In his lab at the University of Southern California's Institute of Creative Technologies, Rizzo's team has developed 14 combat scenarios, building in the sights, sounds, vibrations, and even the smells of war. The clinician has a control panel where they can adjust the lighting, the time of day, the number of people, where a bomb goes off, if a plane is flying over. So you can customize the experience moment by moment in real time for helping the person to go back to something that's relevant for them. The Brave Mind team hopes its tech can be used to treat many other instances of PTSD, not only that of returning soldiers, but those suffering trauma from other walks of life. Certainly, we're going to be facing a wave of mental health challenges, specifically with healthcare providers um, on the front lines of COVID. With his VR sessions behind him, Merkel is finding happiness again, volunteering in the veteran community. One of his initiatives, Waves of Valor teaches returned service members to serve. They're not thinking about their pain. They're not thinking about their depression. They're not thinking about the war. They just want to do for themselves. And the healing part is, it's actually surprising. It's not veteran to veteran. It's not therapist to veteran. It's community. The VR just opens up a world of thought because it's a, a novel, different way of doing things. But it's opening up how people think about how we help people heal and get past uh, trauma and other things. Great Mind has pretty much saved my life in more ways than one. Okay, um, the good news, uh, that client, um, after doing more service work for veterans, like what you just saw, decided he wanted to get his doctorate in clinical psych and uh, is actually leaving on Monday for his internship up in Anchorage, Alaska to work with indigenous populations. So, I mean, poster child, is everybody going to have the same effect that he's had? No. Uh, but I think, you know, this is one tool that trauma-focused therapists uh, can leverage and uh, hopefully uh, get some benefit. And that brings me to the point, we're not replacing clinicians. It's a tool to extend the skills of a clinician. Technology doesn't fix anybody. It's the clinical implementation of it. And as mentioned in the video, you know, scent machines, physical props, base shaker platform, you feel the vibration of the Humvee when you're driving it or a bomb going off. Uh, we have a scent machine now that's very low cost and, and quite portable that puffs out little nasty scents of war, gunpowder cordite, burning rubber, stuff like that, diesel. And natural navigation control, you hold the weapon when you're on a foot patrol anyway, and you have a controller that you can use to navigate around in the world. And some groups that we work with are experimenting with more high-end equipment, like this from the Norwegian military, where you're actually on a, it's a, probably like an $8,000 uh, treadmill, but you can walk in the world in a simulated way. Some people actually believe that embodied action uh, improves outcomes, but that's yet to be seen. <clears throat> so some of the, just a, 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 I'm just gonna mention a couple of the studies that have been done. Our initial study, open clinical trial, first 20 treatment completers, people who had tried some evidence-based approach but had achieved no benefit. These were the outcomes from that study. Uh, to put it in a finer point here, these are the 16 that no longer met PTS criteria in a PCLM. This is from down at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. Uh, you know, we had independent folks running the study and at Camp Pendleton. Um, four did not benefit in that sample. Uh, Barbara Rothbaum's group uh, did this study and I think published in 2014, um, following patients up to a year follow-up, showing what commonly you see with, with PE is that people continue to get better even after treatment in some cases. Um, and they also looked at startle response physiological measurements um, to uh, try to more objectify uh, change over time in following treatment. And uh, also looked at cortisol reactivity, which shows, you know, good mirroring to the clinical outcomes. Uh, uh, Deborah Bidel at the University of Central Florida doing great work with more um, intensive treatment, a uh, three-week program. You fly into Orlando, um, you know, stay at a hotel and do VR each morning over the course of three weeks and do what they call trauma management therapy, a collection of 
traditional psychotherapy methods customized to the user um, and finding good results from that. Uh, a couple of randomized controlled trials have been done in these cases with the old version showing equivalence to prolonged exposure. And in a study that is under review now, and I can't talk too much about it, this is the pre-trial uh, description of the protocol uh, with Joanne Defeaty and Barbara Rothbaum, Mike Roy, um, showing that um, you know both VR and prolonged exposure did quite well. Uh, we didn't really see with across the whole sample differences, but we, in our pre-planned comparisons, we predicted that people with comorbid depression would, would get a better effect with VR. And that was in fact, what we found. Uh, other studies, Greg Rieger's group, looking at reductions in suicidal ideation, following both VR and prolonged exposure. Um, and then our work took a turn in 2016 to develop a military sexual trauma app. And basically um, we thought we'd have an easy go of it, just building up barracks and stuff in our already existing worlds. But after interviewing a lot of folks that went through this, we found out most sexual trauma in the military has happened in civilian areas stateside. Um, so we had to build out a bunch of civilian content and a perpetrator that could pop up or turn up that is customizable. Certainly we're not re you know, recreating sexual assault or trauma experience. Uh, just a context in which this happens in order to conduct uh, prolonged exposure. And because of the nature of the population, we were limited to on this proposed on this grant to running a safety feasibility trial. So 11 folks went through it. Good news, no critical incidents and more good news. Um, you know, we with even with that small sample, we got statistically significant clinically meaningful reductions in PTS. Um, but much more work is needed to be done and translation of that to civilian populations. Uh, you know, we've done uh, diagnostic approaches looking at psychophysiological responding with fixed content from Brave Mind that's uh, delivered in a variety of ways um, across these six studies. Uh, Mike Roy did a study pre and post fMRI uh, uh, before and after a uh, course of treatment with the system showing changes in brain activation in the core areas you would expect. But I think this was 18 subjects. So again, you know, we still need a lot more work in that. I'm going to skip over this because it'll take too let's, much time. It, let's, it's a pre-deployment resilience training system that we developed um, to help folks develop coping skills prior to a deployment, but it takes too long to go through it. Um, but the punchline here is that <clears throat> I think we're, you know, we're gathering evidence that shows that at the bare minimum, uh, non-inferiority to traditional method um, and sometimes better outcomes with certain populations. But uh, you know, the other factor is breaking down barriers to care. And in our last randomized controlled trial at, um, uh, at informed consent after the, the uh, recruit was described they were you know prolonged exposure was described to them vr exposure was described to them but they were told you're going to be randomized to a condition but if you had your druthers if you could pick what would you pick um and quite interestingly 77 percent across the whole sample uh, would have picked vr so this may be a tool to engage digital generation service members or folks that are drawn to this kind of technology um, again, it's, it's just another tool. It's uh, not a replacement for what we already know works well. Um, it's another option. And, and we know from the literature that when patients are given an option and given some empowered to make some decisions about their treatment when presented with a menu of evidence-based approaches, they typically do better. So civilian translation, plenty of trauma in the world, as we all know. And so our efforts now are, are Take, trying to take everything we've learned in this area, translate it to the civilian sector and for other groups where the occupational stress is overwhelming, not unlike that of a combat veteran. So um, worked with, um, with Google on a project to develop applications initially addressing de-escalation. Uh, like for example, the guy on the bottom right is uh, modeled to be a mentally ill person harassing people at a bus stop and teaching the proper skills and tactics while also, you know, building a context where, you know, you're putting some pressure on uh, the trainee 
uh, in terms of the annoyance factor and everything. Um, and our work with the LAPD, with the RAND Corporation, and we built out one for a home visit, a domestic dispute um, that we, we were going to test it last year, but COVID got in the way. So uh, this fall, this study will be run. And I look at it as a toe in the water with policing. Uh, police are not much different than combat veterans in terms of their hesitancy to admit they're having problems. Um, but we know that problems do exist. And I, I suspect that uh, even though I have data on this, that a lot of the problems we see in policing might be the result of sort of a th sub-threshold PTS uh, condition where you might have the emotional numbing and maybe hypervigilance, sort of a toxic combination for pulling a trigger, um, or, you know, maybe some racial bias mixed in. But with getting that into the police department, you got to start somewhere. And so getting it into the academy before people are on the beat for 20 years is this the strategy we're trying to take with this and trying to couch it as a training experience and moving forward from there. Also, you know, docs, uh, you know, I, this is leading into the COVID work, but if we look pre-COVID, doctors and nurses are, you know, at the high end of the suicide scale, the study with nurses um, showed male and female nurses way over the civilian non-nurse population in terms of suicide risk. Um, physicians, same thing, one and a half to almost two times the rate. Um, add COVID into the mix, and you're seeing from the various studies that have come out, uh, increases in the frontline healthcare professional uh, providers uh, in all these different areas. Um, a study out of China very early on it was quite shocking in that uh, survivors of COVID, when they were released from the hospital, filled out the PCL5C. And even though this doesn't mean they have PTSD, 96% of them were over the 50 point threshold. Uh, certainly many have resolved, but um, you know, early warning sign here, uh, as of October of last year, the military suicide rate across all branches had increased 20% in 2020, 30% in the army. Um, opioid drug use uh, in samples of blood draws from hospital admissions for COVID, you know, 35% increase in non-prescribed fentanyl, 44% heroin, uh, you know, so, you know, is this going to resolve over time? Hopefully for most, um, but we need to be uh, ever prepared to deal with these challenges. Uh, this is a case series where um, it's exposure therapy using VR to help people overcome their fear of going out after having a COVID infection and approaching things. Very small study, but not anything we're going to brag about at this point, even though there were positive findings, but it's showing a direction. And more recently, uh, this study came out in February in JAMA, showing about a 30% PTS rate um, after, um, I believe, um, I think there was... A, 30 days post COVID, uh, and, but a lot of the folks were three, six months down the road as well, and how it compares with other natural disasters, if you will. Um, so plenty of work on our hands. So our approach is take everything we learned uh, from the combat related work and some of the applications and try to think about a way to translate it um, for the civilian sector. And our approach is a cross-platform approach, not just VR, but the introduction of virtual humans, as you'll see um, in various contexts. So why don't I just pop that up now? I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? So basically, that is an application that we, we had built a, a prototype for the Army, but it's for healthcare professionals to have a safe, private, anonymous place to engage with this agent and uh, take questionnaires like the, you know, the uh, pro call and so on, and get feedback from the agent on where they stand and discussion of the various self-care programs. Uh, a lot of times healthcare professionals don't want to talk to a real person <laughs> about um, what they're going through. And maybe this offers a way uh, to do that. Uh, putting that same kind of technology on a mobile device. Uh, we had done a prototype for the army 
um, taking a wellness uh, manual that they had created, Performance Triad, uh, and trying to put it into a mobile app. They'd already done a mobile app, but essentially it was the manual mobilized. And it, the, the paper manual is much better than trying to do it on a cell phone, quite honestly. Um, and so how can you make these things stick? Well, put a virtual agent in there, because we know that you know the median number of uses of mental health mobile apps after the first download and, and trial is one time. So p these things aren't sticking. So can we do things like this? Welcome back. Let's get this daily check-in started. How are you feeling right now? Great, thanks. Next, let's record your daily reflection. I'd really like to hear about your day. Can you tell me three things that went well for you today and what you think might have caused these good things to happen? Remember, research suggests that reflecting on the good things that happen in our lives can affect us positively. So this is a three Being a reflection. service member can be stressful. When you feel stress, your breathing becomes fast and shallow and your muscles tense up. This increases your heart rate, blood pressure, and muscle tension. And now your body isn't getting the amount or the type of fuel it needs for optimal responsiveness and health. That's why relaxation and breathing exercises are a game changer. They're simple actions that go a long way to reduce blood pressure and mental tension. One of the best is tactical breathing, a four count method of breathing that helps you relax and focus, just like on the rifle range. First, I'll demo this technique, and then I'll walk you through it slowly. After that, you can try it on your own. Sound good? So then okay. he goes through this uh, uh, modeling of the approach, and then? Looks like you got it. Now you can try it on your own. Which environment do you find the most relaxing? Being surrounded by all of these trees is really peaceful. The mountains are very calming. I love the sound of the ocean. I can stay and breathe with you, or I can give you some privacy. What do you prefer? So then uh, we can also tap into a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. And Nice work today. Um, Hit next to see your score report. Good job. You're getting there. You met your exercise goal. So but you get the idea you with that. Um, of course, going from military to civilian apps. That's what we're aiming to do next. Um, now, um, we're just, I think we have funding to do this, by the way. It's on the, on the fence right now, but that's, that's really, we want to translate that prototype into a civilian uh, app at the moment. Anyway, of course, exposure therapy, we already built a bog room kind of a thing, but building out the hospital settings in a civilian context, it might be useful for engaging people in a, a trauma-focused approach. Um, for their experience, whether they're healthcare professionals or survivors of COVID um, or family members. And also there's a lot of content that's already out there for mindfulness, meditation. And these are things that can be delivered on a $300 headset with no computer. Like you may have heard of the Oculus Quest uh, where it's, all the processing is done on the headset. Um, so that's sort of like a, a future vision or integrating a range of technological approaches way providing options for patients okay so um oh and this is these would be some of the targets uh, we anticipate um, addressing along the way it's really just an excuse for me to put fauci up there and put that slide in anyway to conclude war sucks but <clears throat> it does drive innovation in medicine certainly battlefield medicine has evolved over the years but also if you look at the history of uh, these other areas, um, war has been a, a factor uh, in driving advances. You know, the Army Alpha Beta, World War I, you know, kicking off intelligence testing and the basis for neuropsychology. World War II, clinical psychology didn't exist really. Um, it was, psychologists were trained as assessors and researchers, uh, but battle fatigue or combat neurosis after World War II overwhelmed psychiatry. And that's what drove the VA to set up the internships programs. It took newly minted PhD psychologists and you know developed the field of clinical psychology. Um, Harry Truman also formed NIMH. I think it was in '47, specifically to address combat neurosis. 
We've seen over the years other wars drive applications in other areas, TBI, neuropsych, neuropsych rehab, uh, you know, Vietnam, of course, driving recognition of PTS, OIF, OEF, I think drove advances not only in VR, but in other areas, computerized prosthetics and so forth, and rehab activities. And so the war on COVID and occupational stress, you know, will this, we'll be able to leverage this work and drive innovation for all. Um, I want to thank um, some of our corporate sponsors who donated equipment to us over the years and specifically Soldier Strong, a foundation that now provides to any VA for free any of the equipment needed to um, deliver the Brave Mind application. And thus far, um, in the month before COVID, it went out to 12 sites. Now we're up to about 20 sites. It was a lull during COVID. Um, but with that said, for more detail, I think you guys have uh, a chapter and we have a smaller publication out, but I want to jump to the very end here and just um, say, if anybody's interested, a copy of this talk, all the content freely available, send me an email, I'll pop it up on a download site. And thank you very much for your time and attention. All righty. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> fascinating uh, work. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know what to say. We tried very hard when I was um, director of the forensic program at NOVA uh, to, we um, had people uh, teaching us about Oculus and we also de designed an actual virtual reality uh, platform uh, to teach our forensic psychologists how to testify in court and how to do evaluations in our mental health court. And we even had the mental health court judge who uh, um, she allowed us to make an avatar of her as long as we made her blonde. <laughs> and, uh, it, um, uh, Dr. Ackle, who sometimes gets on, um, uh, was very much in charge of that program, and we really are hoping that she's going to um, be hired to replace, uh, well, nobody will replace, but to, to, to take Dr. Shapiro's um, position, um, because I think this is the future. Um, in training programs. I think this is how we're going to train our students when, especially when we can't get live people because it is not necessarily ethical to work with live people, as you said, uh, Skip, we don't want to um, practice on, on the real people. <laughs> we practice and then make it perfect when we deal with our, our patients. But thank you so much for such a, a fabulous, fabulous introduction to what's going on. Uh, thank you for the kind words. How about jumping on? Other people who want to jump in? We can be unmuted because we only have a few people. I see Dr. Um, uh, uh, Patricia Vicencio Carrillo joined us from Spain, from Madrid, Spain. So we. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Sure, sure, Amy. Yeah. So, yeah, this is amazing. Thank you so much for really getting us present to the impact of the war. And then, you know, the challenges of this mental health lasted for a long, long time. And I have a curious question like um because i have a company kind of more doing um, the telehealth platform and we look into vr and one of the big concerns because it's targeting chronic patients and elders is the safety and on so i'm always curious like how auto researchers structure their safety protocols yes uh, well certainly um you know there are issues that we have to uh, uh be vigilant for uh, probably the first thing that pops up is that for some people putting on a VR headset, um, they get motion sick. And, you know, that's a deal breaker. Um, and, and sometimes folks do it and they feel a little shaky in the beginning and then they do it again. And it's a little bit less so. And so, the, you know, in some sense, there's an adaptation that may occur, but that's just, just the reality. It's gotten much better over the years now that that the quality of the technology has gotten better you don't have a lot of lag when somebody okay. turns their head and it takes a while for the image to update that's a you know that's a recipe for cyber sickness uh, so you've got that the, the second area 
is you know having well-trained professionals that understand how to use this technology ethically and professionally uh, there needs to be some training in that and you know things like you know oftentimes uh, with uh, with the PTSD app most of the time person sitting in a chair uh, but there are foot patrol scenarios where they're standing and you've got to have sort of a a barrier on this platform that allows the person to move around, but safely mm -hmm. not because they're occluded from the outside world. You don't want them to, to fall and stumble and, and, you know, so you've got pragmatic challenges like that, but I think they're all manageable. And, and the good news is, is that most clinical applications, you're not talking about putting somebody in a headset for six hours. You're talking about a, you know, maybe a 20 to 40 minute session, which most people handle, you know, quite easily. Um, and, and the hope is, is that, uh, you know, we can do homework now where we can send these standalone headsets home uh, where people can do applications at home, uh, but we have to be able to manage that it's not too provocative and that we're, I mean, you know, look at in, in with prolonged exposure, you're recommending homework for people to go to places they've been avoiding. Um, well, if you don't know if they actually do it, um, and you don't know how safe it's going to be for them. Are they going to have a panic attack? Um, but maybe you can ramp up to that by having simulations, spherical video simulations of being in a crowded Walmart or being at a restaurant with Middle Eastern restaurant or whatever, you know, whatever the avoidance uh, setting is, you can start to do things like that. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I have to say this over and over again. We're not in the business of putting therapists out of work. We're in the business of helping people to do their job better and to extend their skills. So this might be an option for some folks. Hi, I also, yeah, I also wanted to thank you. It's really interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask, first of all, about age-related differences in uh, responses, but first, uh, just uh, to ask you, how, why did you choose this background? And if it's supposed to invoke safety or whatever, yes. I mean, these two soldiers armed, just, yeah, that's how did just, you choose that? That's, that was just simply a screenshot from one of the, um, uh, from, I, th I believe that's the uh, Iraq marketplace scenario. We have 14 different worlds because for the combat related, stuff it could be an afghan world and iraq world out in the desert in the mountains in a small city um and so this is just you know this is actually um a section called safe zone so uh if we want to uh, put the patient after they go through their trauma narrative and they want to process it but they want to stay in the environment we can pop them teleport them to this area where they're around soldiers um and they can continue their discussion in the context of the simulation. So just, I mean, we, we can, in, in our simulations, as you saw, the clinician interface allows the clinician to introduce everything. So in this context, we can eliminate all the characters and have it be an empty city at, at, at dawn uh, with just the sound of the wind. Or if we can add civilian characters, or we can add children, or, uh, you know, uh, military police or service members on patrol. So, you know, it's just a matter of what works for what patient uh, to engage them in their trauma narrative. I like that a bit. We've been using virtual reality to work with people who have fear of public speaking, whether they be in the, the academic community or the general public. And we've had um, clients who are in their 70s and students and high school students and all of them seem to uh, be able to go into the virtual world. Very few people are not able to do this. So, and um, uh, same with fear of flying. That, yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we found uh, that, uh, you know, the effects, uh, you know, are pretty much equivalent in terms of you know, efficacy outcomes across the spectrum of people we've tested. Um, and there's a, an emerging area of respite care using VR with older populations. It's getting a good bit of traction where, you know, you have somebody in a nursing home, 
and you give them 20, 30 minutes a day where there's a ton of this type of content, nature content, spherical video content, and a person can put on this, you know, very comfortable, lightweight headset and be in this, in this different world than their surroundings. And thus far, early research has shown that to be quite positive with older populations. Um, I have a slide of my 85 year old mom uh, doing VR that I can pop up at the end when I, I was gonna include it, but I jumped ahead of it because I was running out of time. But you can see how an older person reacts. If you wanna stick around at the end of our hour, I'll, I'll pop that up. Uh, I actually did an Oculus um, uh, demo using being on a roller coaster. <laughs> did you get sick from that? <laughs> I did. It terrified me. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the that's one of the prototypic cyber sickness inductions. Uh, <laughs> the roller coaster scenario. You, you know, because you're getting all the the optical flow of movement, but no inner ear stimulation, and that's you know. So people with fear of roller coasters, I say, you know, all right, do that in imagination. I don't know if I want to put you in a VR world for that. You didn't yeah, I had an experience like um, the, the, the height, you know, when you're like in a, I don't know, 100 floor building. And I didn't really think I have a fear of height, but my knees are literally shaking. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny. It was like, and then when it drops, that was even worse. You just feel like, oh my gosh, like I literally was like, like this <laughs> when it draws yeah yeah and this is what we're in the business of really i mean let's face it we're our job as therapists is to activate emotions at a level where we can begin to work with them to help a person uh to regulate or uh, whatever the you know I, i'm 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 therapeutic perspective agnostic on this uh, depending on how you want to use this content you can apply. Um, and, and Marilyn, you mentioned about the public speaking. I want, I want to bring this up on the ethical professional end of things. Um, what we're seeing is like with Oculus and other, other applications, you can download, anybody can just get a headset and download a fear public speaking application, you know, with various crowds, size of crowds and all that. And even though that's, you know, fear of public speaking in extreme forms is a clinical condition, we kind of give that a pass for self-help. All right, fair enough. It's a skill, you know, you practice, you get better. Um, but uh, beyond that, I, I'm pretty uh, old school on this, that you need a clinician in the loop to do a proper assessment diagnosis, to develop a treatment plan, to initiate that treatment plan, to monitor that treatment plan, to monitor modulate the treatment plan as patient changes. So in, in any of these contexts, I think you have to have a clinician in the loop. That may change in the future as AI gets better. And that's probably going to be the biggest controversy in psychology in the next 10 years is when you have a tireless 24 seven encyclopedic knowledge virtual therapist that remembers everything about your dialogue remembers everything that you've done, can pick up vocal prosody changes and keep track of it over time. You know, that's a scary thought. Um, you know, um, my toe in the water is, let's keep it in a clinical context with therapists and maybe where there's a gap in the therapist's time, you give them something like that mobile app, that mobile wellness app, where they can interact with the character on a daily basis for not an onerous amount of time, three minutes, you know, tip of the day, you know, three best things that happen, gratefulness stuff, you know, positive psychology, whatever, you know. If you have a virtual person who remembers everything, it's gonna put all of us out of business. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> At least people my age and older, for sure, because I remember- <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Yeah, I also have one more curious question. So for the specific, like for the work for PTSD, how do you develop the story and I do interview some of the veterans and really kind of capture those stories and reproduce it? Yes, I mean, you know, this is this pretty much so far has followed lockstep, the, the standard protocol that uh, Barbara, Barbara Rothbaum and Edna Foa and all have put together for delivering traditional PE. Um, where 
you know, really the first couple of sessions, getting to know the client and understanding what the, the context of the trauma was and what's going on in their life. And it's the same thing with this. You know, nobody gets into VR until um, typically, maybe at the end of the third session, a little taste of a non-provocative setting. Uh, but you don't begin the exposure proper until you've gotten a good clear grounding as to what, what the issues are for the client. And then clinician can design what are going to be the target areas, what is the set and so forth. I had a, a question as well, um, Skip, about domestic violence, which is, of course, the area that I do so much work in. Um, I have found that um, PE is not useful for many battered women. Uh, it's simply too um, uh, stimulating for them uh, and they become too frightened. And so they really um, can't, uh, it, it just can't be used as well with them. I know sexual assault victims, it does get used well with it, um, especially from a lot of Edna Foa's work, uh, we've seen oh. it. Um, and I wonder if VR might um, have a different, um, uh, difference in how, how uh, battered women might react. Well, there is some work going on in Spain um, at Mel Slater's lab where he takes a whole different approach. He's addressing the perpetrator. And so he gets court sent people. And what, what they do is they do an embodied activity where they have the persons wearing a tracked body suit so it can capture their movement and and uh, they have a, an avatar face from a photograph of the person. So they make a representation of the perpetrator and they role play with them and they say, okay, give me an example of one time when you uh, had an argument with your wife, what was that like? And a lot of times these folks aren't aware that they're escalating. So mm -hmm. the person will do it and, and the role player will, you know, try to provoke and push. And then what they do is they put the perpetrator in the role, the role of the, of the virtual partner. Wow. And have the character come out and, and give them some external awareness of how they're coming off and what they're doing and, and give that, you know, they're, they're, if you look up Mel Slater, in fact, he's got a great um, uh, thing, on, a great video on YouTube showing this. Uh, you know, punch in Mel Slater, YouTube, um, mm -hmm. and intimate partner violence, or what, you know, punch in, you have to, I, send me, send me an email, I'll send you the link, <laughs> because okay. I have it, uh, right. but it's, um, you know, there's some promise in those kinds of putting somebody in the shoes of the other. Um, well, it sounds and, like that's empathy teaching yeah. as well. Yeah. And Jeremy Bailson has done a bunch of this with, I'm becoming homeless. On growing up black in America, where you're living it out in a VR simulation. And hopefully, in fact, with the homeless one, he did a really cool study where, you know, if, if you put somebody through these things and you give them a checklist, you know, how empathetic are you now as opposed to before, everybody's going to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a champ at empathy. But what he did was in these, in, after the experiment, he gave them a packet of questionnaires and they made it look like it was by accident. There was a petition that was ongoing in San Francisco uh, for providing more services for the homeless, but it, made, it was made to look like it was accidentally mixed in. But they measured how many times people that went through the VR simulation signed the petition versus people that just got a public service announcement um, and how many, and they found significantly more from the VR experience mm -hmm. signed the petition. In other studies where there's, they're doing this pro-social kind of activity. They find when they have a Confederate walk by the person as they're leaving the lab and drop books on the floor, that the user going through the VR experience is gonna be more likely to stop and help that person pick up the book. So people are starting to move towards getting more behavioral representations of what we might call a construct of empathy. I just want to make a comment about the PE. Uh, when you're working with PE, very often people become flooding themselves. They lose control of the situation that they're imagining. And then it's difficult for them to stop. Whereas you're doing the exposure uh, with VR, you have much greater control. You can start at a different level and you don't find the flooding occurring that you do with P. That's why I think that the VR has a lot more to offer 
um, in the long run. I think more control and shorter uh, treatment plans because of that. I'm going to have to go in about. Yes, five we, oh, I, I, I want to thank you uh, so much, Skip. Sorry for not being at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's amazing work you all are, are doing. Thank you. I think the organizers are important. You're the future and the present and the future. And we, I think it's, uh, we can develop uh, resources for patients like any mindful, um, um, control, emotional control resources through these devices. And thank you so much. I, I hope you will come back again. <laughs> All righty. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 anybody want to say last words? I know we could go on and on and on. Um, I think this is the, the future of, of uh, what we're going to be doing. And, and um, I think it's so exciting. And it's exciting to see. I've known uh, Dr. Rizzo for uh, many years through the American Psychological Association. And I, I'm uh, just amazed um, at how far technology has gone in a short period, relatively short period of time. So uh, I'm going to take some of this back as my role of, of chair of the task force um, on the working group on uh, professional guidelines for professional psychologists. I, I don't get the titles straight, um, but we've been talking about the use of mobile apps, the use of technology. How do you know that it's really working? And I think that Dr. Rizzo has explained to us is that they're already taking what is evidence-based work in our field and applying it in a new way. And uh, that is so exciting. And thank you, um, Marilyn, for contacting uh, Dr. Risso. And thank you, Dr. Risso, for bearing with us in terms of trying to get the right dates and the right times. And, and uh, no we problem. wish you well, and, and we will definitely be in contact. All righty. Well, so we'll say goodbye. We'll see you again, not next Thursday, but I think it's the first Thursday in July. Uh, we will be back again with another presentation. I believe it's going to um, be a presentation on telehealth um, and using telehealth in our therapy work with um, uh, Dr. Jana Martin and, and um, Dr. Morgan um, Sammons, who are, are, I think, the top experts in knowing what all the ethical uses are and the different ways to use it. So jump on and join us then and again, Thank you so much for everybody being with us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.